d'Arezzo. Guido from the town of Arezzo in Italy is one of the most famous music teachers of all time. Guido lived in the years 991, 92, and we know he passed away sometime after 1033. He wrote a very, very famous treatise called the Micrologus, and it was the very first music teaching manual that we know existed. Guido was a monk, and he taught in the church, and he used chant. And I have a piece of chant on the board, and this was one of Guido's teaching hymns. It's called Hymn to St. John. It's, a, it's a, a text in honor of St. John the Baptist. You can see it closes with Sancte Johannes in honor of um, St. John the Baptist. So um, I'm going to sing it for you, and I want you to think about how this musical phrase is constructed. Now, notice the notes look a little strange. They're just black dots. There's no stems. That's um, typical of, of chant notation. The stemming of notes didn't come along and, um, until later in time. And also notice there's no real bar lines. Um, there's some breath marks and that follow the commas in the phrases of the music. Um, uh, this one has got a full bar, and those who are experts and scholars in this early medieval music will, will understand why he went all the way through the staff here, but not so in these other spots. We're not going to go into that today. That's, that's a whole other uh, discussion. But I want to sing it for you, and I want you to listen and think about how this tune is constructed, and then once you hear it, we're going to talk about a few of the interesting things about it. So remember, Guido, monk, teaching in the church, using this hymn, probably with a choir, maybe a choir of older gentlemen monks and young children monks. So it's a choir and that they'll all be men. So this, this is what it would sound like. B. Ut queant loxis, resonere fibris, mi regestorum, famuli tuorum, so they polluti labire atum sancte Johannes. So it sounds ancient. It doesn't sound like a typical praise song or hymn that we would sing today. And um, that was a good West Texas version of some, some Latin there. Um, so I want you to think about each one of those little phrases. Um, Unt quaint loxis and then resonere fibris. Guys, take a minute and glance at the first note. I'm just going to circle the first note and the first syllable of that first phrase. I'm going to do the same thing here. Going on up. Going down to the second line. Almost finished. Oh, that one's different. Do you see interesting phenomenon happening? Guys, notice that the first note of each phrase moves up a step. You start on C, here's our C. You have a C, and then you have a D, and then you have an E, you have an F, and a G, and an A, but we don't go on up to B. In Guido's day, the scale only had six notes. He would only sing C, D, E, F, G, A. We didn't use B and C. The scale was smaller. It was called a gamut or a hexachord. Now, notice in the boxes, what have I put along with each one of the pitches? The syllable oot and a C. The syllable re and a D. The syllable mi and an E. A fa and an F. A sol and a G and a la and an A. For those of you who've had a little bit of experience singing in choirs, this should begin to be a bit familiar. I'm going to suggest that hmm, re, mi, fa, so, la means something to you. It meant something to Guido. Back in the day, Guido taught his young singers how to sing this hymn. Guido put his hand up in front of the choir and he would point to different points of knuckles on his hand that matched the beginning syllable of each phrase. So the tip of his thumb was oot. Oot, re, mi, fa, so, la, so, fa, mi, re, oot. 
and he would teach the young singers how to sing this hymn and understand the relationships between the phrases, connect those syllables to knuckles on his hand, and teach them to sing by following his hand, such as he would go, do, re, mi, re, do, and then the choir would imitate, do, re, mi, re, do, do, re, mi, fa, mi, fa, mi, re, do, do, re, mi, fa, mi, fa, mi, re, do, and he would use his hand as the tool to train his young musicians. Okay, this is the solemnization system. You all understand it. Many of you have experienced singing soulfish. It's an international communication tool among musicians today, but it started all the way back with Guido. Why oot and not do? Well, we now know that the syllables actually came from the text of this hymn. They weren't just random syllables made up from someone. They were related to this Latin text. But the singing people, oh, in the 1800s realized that oot is a very difficult syllable to sing. So what they did is just universally began to change out of oot and use do, which is a much more melodious, great singing syllable. So, do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do became the standard. For those of you who just want one extra added little bit of information, Guido used his hand. Where do we use a hand to sing today? How many of you all are familiar with the do, re, mi, kodai hand sign symbols that we use in elementary school and choir today? Direct descendant from Guido D'Arezzo. So we owe Guido a great, great deal.